I'm going to be talking today about some of our successes and challenges in restoring Lake Sturgeon to Cape Lake, um, or recovering Lake Sturgeon to Cape Lake. So before I get to that, I want to talk a little bit about how, how we came to be doing this in Cuba Lake. Um, back in the mid-90s, uh, New York State started a Lake Sturgeon stocking program as part of a what was a, a fairly basic um, recovery plan for lake sturgeon in New York State. And about 15 years ago, we um, embarked on this process to update that plan and involve more partners and, and get a more robust um, plan of attack for delisting this species from uh, state listed threatened down to, um, well, hopefully not on the list at all, obviously. Um, so we engaged a bunch of our partners, and these are some of the components of the plan. I'm not going to go into them in detail. Um, but I put this up here because Cuba Lake, whether or not they were native there, I think is kind of fuzzy. Um, and Don and I don't agree on that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but they were stocked initially in, in Cuba Lake in 1995. Um, and so we have this population there that's growing. Don talked a lot about uh, their juvenile food habits. Um, and so obviously this lake is really good for juveniles. There's a lot of feeding areas. Uh, we're, we're seeing adults. There's a lot of places for them to find food as well. The question has always been whether or not they're going to be able to spawn there. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So Cuba Lake is part of the Central New York Management Unit in our plan. Um, in each of these management units, the goal is to have 750 spawning adults. And that's for the whole management unit. It's not necessarily for each spawning unit within that management unit, which is kind of helpful. Um, <laughs> the other part of the goal for, re for recovery and delisting oops, oops. Um, is to have successful reproduction in three out of five years. Um, and that's to make sure that we have the, the genetic diversity that we need to um, keep this population persisting in the long term. Um, so part of that for stocking for genetic diversity. Um, so getting to the meat of it, are they able to actually spawn in Cube Lake? Um, <coughs> Normally, where sturgeon are, are successful in spawning, they've got a pretty good sized river to do it in. Uh, they got big substrate, like dinner plate sized cobbles, or, or, or riprap is really uh, one of their preferred spawning substrates, and a really heavy flow. They, they need, like, I'm not going to throw up numbers because I'll get them wrong, but it's a really fast, stiff current. Um, and in our lake, our lakes, our rivers, by the time the sturgeon get around to spawning in late May, early June, our workers are down the base flow. The, the snow is gone. So the only way we can get that amount of flow going on is if we get a really big rainstorm. And in June 2017, that's exactly what happened. Um, this fish here was one of 10 or 15 fish in Fall Creek um, that actually spawned. Um, uh, I got a phone call, I went down and I looked and I'm standing on the bridge with 15 other people and oh, what are they doing? And they were engaging in very classic, um, obvious spawning behavior. Um, heading up to the head of the pool, splashing around, dropping back, going back up again. It was like a two minute cycle. Um, it was very exciting. Um, but that was Fall Creek, which is up here. And that falls is uh, right there. Um, it's only about a mile and a quarter up from the lake. So part of the lake sturgeon life cycle, these eggs drift into the interstitial spaces. And then a couple weeks later, they hatch out. And the larvae actually drift for a little bit before they start to feed. A mile isn't a whole lot of space to do that drifting part in. Um, so whether or not you know that part was going to be successful was still a question in my mind. Um, the other options for spawning um, are uh, Cascadell Creek, which is very small and has the falls right here, and uh, Six Mile Creek, which is about the same 
size as, as Fall Creek, but there's a dam and falls right here. And then Hugo Inlet comes in over here into this man-made canal, but there's a dam and a fishway right here. And if you were at the workshop on Wednesday, our fishway is 50 years old in Daniel. Um, it's a Daniel, Daniel ladder. But there's no way an adult sturgeon can get out that thing. It's too small. Um, the, the spacing is too short. Um, there are probably some years when we get a really big rainstorm when maybe they can swim up over the dam like everything else does. Um, but for the base, basically, for the most part, they can't get up here. And there's some really nice spawning habitat up in here, but they can't get to it. Um, so really, these other three trips are, are their options for the Lake. So what we're doing as part of this recovery plan is we're monitoring their spawning activities. Um, one of the ways we do that is we respond to phone calls and people say, hey, they're spawning. Um, the other way we do it is by actually targeting their, um, their holding areas with uh, short gill net sets during their spawning season, hoping to get them before they run up to, to make their spawning runs. And we've been fairly successful doing that. Um, we're able to get two or three fish per net when we are there at the right time. Um, we use large mesh gill nets, so there's very little bycatch. Um, the occasional card, the occasional brown trout, um, freshwater jump, and that's about it. Um, all of those fish are, like, like Dawn said, they're pit tagged, they're toy tagged. We take all the metrics off of them. Uh, this summer we actually started taking uh, fin rays for aging as well. Um, we need to start getting a, a look at our ages out there. Um, and like I said, we're continuing to stock to build that genetics. So this is the stocking history for Cuba Lake going all the way back to the beginning in 1995. There were a couple of smaller stockings over the years as our hatchery got the hang of, of rearing lake sturgeon and, and getting the eggs from the or from the St. Lawrence River. Um, and then VHS hit and there was a hiatus. Um, well, we figured out the disease protocols and, and how to do this successfully. Um, in that process, the Genoa National Fish Hatchery in Wisconsin, with the Fish and Wildlife Service, they came in and helped us out, helped out with some of our, our rearing difficulties at Oneida Hatchery. And uh, our program's actually been fairly consistent since then. Um, we've been able to stock about 2,500 fish a year. Um, the difference in 2019 is our Oneida Hatchery folks um, wanted to do a better job. And so they started looking into the diet of the fish that they were raising and um, did an experiment and had fantastic success, fantastic growth. These are the biggest fish I think we've ever stocked out there. Um, and they had some surplus, so we actually got twice as usual. That's not gonna be a regular thing though. Um, we're gonna go back to 2500, that's our, that's our goal. Um, Other people this morning have already talked about the lake history, so I'm going to skip that. And go right into our population estimate. So, like I mentioned, we're tagging, netting these fish and tagging them. Um, we get about two or three fish per net um, in the spring in our, in our holding area. Um, but that's not really enough fish to build a market capture population estimate. Um, you really need to have more tags out there. So we've also been tagging fish that are caught on the lake trout egg tank in the fall at Teganic. Um, so that's what this fish was caught at. Um, for when the subadults started aging into the into the nets, um, they were they were getting caught all the time in the lake trout nets. Um, they're getting too big for the lake trout nets now, so we have to set extra nets um, just for the lake sturgeon. But um, for a while there, it was pretty exciting on the hatchery boat because you never knew if you were going to get lake trout or sturgeon. So what does that map look like? Uh, it's pretty ugly. Um, since we're not able to um, meet the assumptions of a normal mark recapture model, um, we had to expand it over time because we've got this long eight-year time series. And um, unfortunately, 
we're also violating some of the other assumptions of the model. We know that these fish moved out into Seneca River, Oneida Lake, Onondaga Lake, and we've caught fish from Seneca River in Hula Lake. It's not a closed system, uh, which is one of the assumptions of this model. Another one of the assumptions of this model is that there's no mortality. Um, in 2011, there were a lot of sea lamprey in the lake, and we know we had some mortality from that. Um, so we violated that one too. Um, what else? So we also have been uh, tagging some of our juvenile and subadult sturgeon um, in hopes that someday they will age into this population and then we'll be able to count their captures and recaptures. But for now, our spring population, we've only got seven recaptures down here at the bottom. And um, that's not enough to do a more complicated model with um, a factor accounting for mortality or for immigration or um, unequal catchability or anything like that. So, and because this data is not normally distributed, I can't ca calculate confidence in it either. So, this is more like how not to do a market capture study. Um, that said, I think these numbers are actually remarkably consistent um, given all of our, our challenges. And none of them are 750, we're not close. But I think 350 is probably a pretty reasonable guess as to how many adult sturgeon we have out in the lake at the moment um, coming to the south end to spawn. That combined with whatever Oneida Lakes estimate comes up to be um, at the moment is not 750 yet, but we're really getting very close, um, which is very exciting. The other part of that recovery is natural reproduction in three out of five years. So 2017, we know we saw spawning in Fall Creek. We actually caught one of those fish from that effort this summer in one of our netting efforts. Um, this fish had no tags at all when we caught it. All of our stocked fish have coated wire tags in them, so we know they're stocked fish. Um, this one didn't. So that was really exciting. Um, that was our first day of shallow sets after weeks of deep sets looking for lake trout. So. Um, that was pretty exciting. And then the next day, we got this one, which did have a coated wire tag. Um, but I wanted to talk about this one a little bit because it was at the south end of the lake and most of our stock fish are stocked at the north end of the lake, so it moved all the way down the lake. Um, we've got lake sturgeon, some of them are home bodies, some of them are roamers. Um, Hugo Lake's a pretty big lake. There's good habitat at the north end, there's good habitat at the south end. But somehow it managed to navigate the fringe or maybe it ran down the middle, I don't know. Um, but it found its way all the way to the south end of the lake. And not quite a bit to eat. This is a pretty chunky little fish. Um, we tagged this fish in August, the first week of August. Don and I were out there this fall putting some more tags in, in, in lake sturgeon. And um, we set our nets there maybe 50 yards or so from where this fish was caught. And on the first day, we caught it again. And it had grown almost two inches in two months, um, which is really pretty remarkable. Um, that site, we caught several fish about this size, maybe a little bit larger, definitely not adult-sized fish. Um, we also caught adult-sized fish there. And, um, so there's multiple age classes all hanging out together in this one little spot, and they're apparently very, um, very fond of it because they stick around and they do well there. It's a good spot. Um, so, we have one year of successful spawning, we know that. Um, that combined with what's going on in the minor lake, maybe we're out of the other side, I'm not sure yet. Um, but if we're gonna depend on Hugo Lake for that, then they need to spawn this year and again next year. Uh, otherwise, we have to start that clock over again. Um, so, pray for rain. If you're the rain. So you're the rain. Um, I need to acknowledge our, our lake surgeon working group. Um, these folks are the ones who really put a lot of work into that lake sturgeon recovery plan. And um, we've got a couple more universities coming on board, helping with the uh, uh, research needs now, now that the plan is out. And um, there's, there's some good work going on. It was kind of like herding cat 